welcome to our webinar, The Future of Insurance Law Restatement of Law Liability Insurance. My name is Vaughn Lawrence. I'm the Director of Communications and Technology. Um, and we're excited to have you guys here today for another interesting webinar. Um, as an organization, PAMIC is focused on providing timely education to our members about issues that directly affect your companies. Um, and this certainly is a topic that will directly affect your companies. Uh, so we're focused on the restatement of law liability insurance today, and we have two excellent presenters from Rebar, Bernsteel, and Debella, Gear, McAllister, and Best. Um, before I begin, I want to take some time to thank our sponsors. We have premium gold sponsors who support our education throughout the year. Uh, we definitely couldn't have webinars like this if it wasn't for their support. Um, those sponsors are Baker Tilly, Donegal, Jen Ree, Guy Carpenter, Markham, Munich Re Hartford Steam Boiler, Mutual Boiler Re, Pennsylvania Lumbermans, uh, Swiss Re, and Willis Re. Um, on the topic of education, we actually have our, uh, our annual convention coming up in August on 5th to the 7th. Uh, it's gonna be our 100th 11th convention and we're gonna be hosting that with Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia. So if you haven't signed up, uh, you can sign up on our website and we'd love to see you guys down in Baltimore for that event as well. Um, now I'd like to introduce our, our presenters. Um, we have a face that you, and a, that you should know by now and a voice you should know in, uh, in Scott Ribney. Uh, he presented on this topic a couple months back uh, before this became law. Uh, and now we're talking about the actual implications of the uh, restatement of law here. So Scott is a partner at, Scott is uh, at Rebar Bernsteel. He's been re representing insurance characters directly for his entire 18 year career. His practice has a particular substantive focus on property insurance, property insurance including both residential and commercial insurance. His experience also encompasses commercial general liability, DNO, fiduciary, commercial crimes, and credit risk insurance. In addition to being a frequent presenter at PAMIC, Scott also appeared as a panel, paneling and seminar sponsored by the Insurance Society of Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Defense Institute, and the Defense Research Institute. And then we have Dick DeBella. Uh, he's a shareholder and vice president at DeBella Gear, McAllister, and Best. Uh, he was a 1973 graduate of Pennsylvania State University, uh, where he earned a bachelor's of arts degree in English, cum laude, uh, Debella earned his Juris Doctorate from Duquesne University School of Law in 1976. Uh, his practice focuses on insurance litigation, civil litigation, arson and fraud defense litigation, and bad faith litigation. He was a founding member of his firm uh, in 1995, and he has over 42 years of experience in the insurance and law field. So um, these are two great presenters uh, that we have today. Uh, and just a reminder, we have uh, all the materials from this webinar, including the, the video of the presentation, will be available on our website throughout the event, or after the event. And then throughout the event, you can ask questions to our presenters using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Scott and we'll begin the presentation. Great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Yvonne. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, when we were first putting together this or talking about this seminar, we were looking at the weather and it's raining. We're thinking, what a great time to be inside looking at a at a computer screen. It's something other than work for a little bit. But now the, the sun's come out. And I'm hoping that we'll uh, continue to give some brief rays of sunlight in light of this newest document that uh, we are all going to be hearing about and dealing with. And um, I'm excited to be speaking with Dick DeBella. He and I are going to be talking about this paper out there, and I'm going to call it a paper on purpose, called the Restatement of Law Liability Insurance. Now, some of you, I'm sure, know and have heard of restatements. Others of you have not. So when we talk today about this document, we're going to follow the following pattern and agenda. For those of you who may not know what this document is or who generated it, um, we're gonna talk a little bit at first about the American Law Institute, how this document came into being. And from that, we're gonna go and talk about only what Dick and I felt were the main points that are going to affect most of your work on a day-to-day -day basis within the insurance industry. By that, we mean policy interpretation, coverage disputes, settlement in terms of liability claims, and then misrepresentations. Now, 
for some quick context before I leave this slide, the, the restatement of law liability insurance is several hundred pages long, and it was designed to cover every aspect of insurance. Um, there's a little bit of something in there for everybody to either like or dislike. But again, we wanted there to be some solid takeaways that when you go back and you're talking with other members of your team, you can say, hey, here's something that might, and I need to stress the word might, be coming down the pipe and that you may start to see from claimants, claimants counsel or other representatives. Now, first, I'm gonna start with what is the American Law Institute? We're gonna call it the ALI. It's an organization that's been around for a very, very long time. And as it was originally incorporated back in 1923, the idea was that it was going to essentially put together summaries of the law. It seems relatively straightforward. Here's what the courts say. And we're going to digest it down into simple books for lawyers to look at and for judges to look at. Now, today, it's grown quite a bit since 1923. And as you can see on this next slide, it's about 4,300 members. Now, look into that a little further. Who's on this organization? Academics, judges, and lawyers. And we put them in that order on purpose because it will give you some insight into the mindset and leanings of the ALI as it has evolved over the years. Now, it's not an organization to be taken lightly because there are 245 members, and that includes all of the Supreme Court justices, the judges on the federal courts of appeal, the chief justices of each state Supreme Court, and the dean of every accredited law school in the country. Now, you hear on the news occasionally some comments coming out of people from the law schools there and some deans. Again, I'm not saying anything one way or another about it other than just saying that should give you some insight into how this document is going to be portrayed and how it's going to be worded. For the lawyers on the this seminar, a lot of this you're going to already have seen and it's not going to be a surprise, but for the non-lawyers in the room, I want to really stress why this is such an important document, or it, it may become a very important document for us. Historically, as I said at the outset, these restatements are supposed to be neutral, just a summary of the law. And if you delve into the statistics, the U.S. Supreme Court has cited some ALI restatement in one sixth of its cases, going down to the local level state and individual federal courts, you can find it roughly 200 times since the ALI was founded. And if you look on the left side of the screen, you can see that they have restatements that cover just about every area, every significant area, let me put it that way, that the lawyers and the law deal with. Now, Remember, I keep coming back to this point about how the group sees itself. I want you to look at on the right side of the screen. This is from the actual restatement of insurance. In the introductory comments, the ALI describes itself as a law reform organization. Now, it seems like a far cry from what its original purpose was supposed to be. There are some judges who take issue with that, not surprisingly, 
And we have up here former Justice Scalia, who, as you can see, really didn't have, um, we'll say, a favorable view of the restatements in terms of giving it the deference that he would other legal cases and opinions from judges. In fact, he goes on to, went on to comment here that the restatement shouldn't be given any other weight than a respected lawyer or scholar. Now, I'm going to contrast that with a statement that we were able to locate from a former Indiana Supreme Court judge. And I know you're, some of you are saying, why are we looking at Indiana? We're in Pennsylvania. We'll get to that in a second. But this judge was quoted as saying he's always willing to consider an argument that comes from the restatement to justify overruling precedent. Now, let's turn this to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. We've all dealt with claims or cases in the state. I'm sure many of you have been before judges before. The counties vary wildly. And I'm sure there are instances where you've been sitting in a courtroom wondering, well, why am I being told one thing when I was under the impression the law said this? That is why when we get right down to it, Dick and I are here today to say the law in Pennsylvania doesn't yet recognize the restatement of insurance. It's new. The final draft just came out not that long ago. But what I can also and will also tell you is that there are other courts around the country that have already referenced portions of the draft of earlier versions of the restatement in court opinions. So we couple that with the extent to which our courts readily refer to the restatements, the, all those long lists we had said before. And Dick and I thought, you know what, we need to share this document with the members of PAMIC because it's going to become part of their lingo. Now you see I have up here a picture of, of Judge Kavanaugh. The reason he's up here, not for any particular persuasion or whatnot, but only to say who knows how the court and him, if he's approved to go to the Supreme Court, will interpret the restatement going forward. What I'll tell you is I went through some of his opinions already to see if he had any leanings one way or another on restatements because it's obviously relevant to what we have here and somewhat surprising there is no insight into that. But now we're going to shift over into really the meat of why many of you, if not all of you, are here today. And that is, why do we need to be worried about this? And I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Dick right now. Thank you, Scott. And, and thank all of you who are on the webinar. Thank you, Pamuk, and especially Vaughn Lawrence, excuse me, for making all of this work. As Scott indicated, one of the primary reasons for this webinar today is not only to alert you as to the impact of the restatement on liability coverage and interpretation and claim handling, but also to let you know that the restatement arguably has application to other areas of insurance. I think Scott mentioned that the restatement is lengthy. It's almost 500 pages in length and it took eight years to finalize. And in an hour's time, we're only going to touch on some of the high or low points, depending upon your point of view. By the way, for only $15, you can go online and download a copy of the final draft of the restatement by going to the ALI website. It will make for great reading on a beach vacation. And I would have liked to have been able to tell you it was only $19.95 plus shipping and handling. And with a special offer, you'd get two copies, but that's not the case. So why should we as insurers be concerned? 
it's not necessarily, I should say the restatement, although it's called the restatement of liability insurance, is not necessarily limited to liability policies. This is the language directly from the restatement. It says, these rules are drafted for application only to liability insurance features of such policies. And look at the rest of it. Although some of the rules may also be usefully applied to other forms of insurance. Notice that word although. Words such as although, however, and but. I'll take you back to your days in grammar school when we learned about conjunctions. I don't know if you remember. Maybe Scott was young enough for the children's show, Conjunction Junction. These three conjunctions, although, however, and but, they can take the beginning of a sentence and completely change what you believed was going to be its stated purpose were you to only hear the first part. For example, you don't know this, but I can see all of you. And by the way, I'm wearing a tie. I love your haircut, although not on you. That outfit looks great, although you shouldn't be wearing it. Again, these rules say that they only apply to law liability insurance, although some of the rules may be usefully applied to other insurance. In other words, beware. It could be argued by an insured's attorney that it could apply to virtually any type of insurance, whether it's property insurance, workers' comp, auto, commercial coverages, et cetera, and whether dealing with in policy interpretation or settlement of claims of insureds. So even if you do not handle liability issues, but exclusively one of these other types of coverage, the restatement may be argued to apply. And that is one of the reasons that we are addressing this with you today. The plain meaning rule and use of extrinsic evidence. And we're gonna talk about that. We'll touch on how the restatement may impact what is commonly referred to as the plain meaning rule. Now I know most of the lawyers here know that the plain meaning rule, which is adopted in Pennsylvania and many jurisdictions, essentially states that courts will not go outside of the insurance contract in order to interpret its terms, if the terms of the policy are understandable, and if the language employed enjoys a plain and consequently clear meaning. Now the court may look to ordinary dictionary definitions of terminology, but that's not really considered going outside of a contract's four corners, since dictionary definitions are by definition, the plain meaning of a term. As you will learn, Plain meaning does not always enjoy a plain meaning, however, under the restatement. We're also going to learn some new terminology here today. Uh, I, I see Scott, by the way, Scott, thank you. Scott was the one that actually put together the PowerPoint, and he referenced the terminology new lingo. Whether you call it new lingo or terminology, there is new terminology in the restatement. The restatement's drafters now have created terms such as mandatory rules and non-mandatory rules. And as you can see by reading the slide, a mandatory rule is a rule of contract law or insurance law that can't be changed by the parties. In other words, the, the restatement has set forth certain rules that no matter what you do or write in your insurance contract, these rules cannot be affected or changed. And then there's non-mandatory rules, which simply is what you can put in your contract uh, and what can be the agreement of the parties. And we'll touch on what these are, or some of them are actually. And these are some examples of the mandatory and non-mandatory rules. Uh, for example, an example of a mandatory rule would be would be waiver and estoppel. You can't as a company contract that away and you really never could. And we don't really see that as a much of a problem in the restatement. It, a waiver and estoppel has always been available to you as, or available to an insured I should say, to either argue for coverage where it may not otherwise exist or to expand coverage. Obviously you can't have a provision in your policy that states regardless of what we do or say about your coverages or any aspect of your claim, and regardless of how poorly or incorrectly our claim rep handles the claim, the policy controls. 
you just can't, you can't contract that away. And the next one's the independence of counsel, and that can't be contracted away. And we're not talking about the obligation to defend, but rather the independence of counsel once he or she is retained to defend an insured. If you're going to defend the insured, you can't state in your policy that we'll defend you, but don't count on the attorney that we retain having any competence or your best interest at heart, et cetera. Again, that's not, that, that's axiomatic. Scott will talk about the section as to reasonable settlements because reasonable settlements under the restatement not be, may not be what your understanding is of a reasonable state settlement or what my understanding is of a reasonable settlement. Uh, as you will learn, it's not so much that we didn't always have to make reasonable settlement decisions, but rather what does the restatement consider to be the framework or the context within which to make such a decision. And you can't contract that away. And you can't contract away issues of prejudice and good faith and fair dealing. Now you see non-mandatory rules, those are essentially what we in an insurance contract can put in the policy and in what the restatement would find to be acceptable as a non-mandatory rule or a default rule. In other words, something that we can contract for. And that's simply new lingo. Uh, additional new lingo or terminology. And let me get to my next slide here. Uh, and I think I skipped the slide, let me go back by one. No, I didn't. I'm sorry. Legal action. That is new lingo, too. Now, the term legal action, we all know what that means, or we all thought we knew what that meant. Uh, in other words, we all thought that a legal action was a lawsuit. Not necessarily so under the restatement. Uh, a legal action now is a demand for redress of a kind that fits within the usual framework of insured liabilities. That demand can now be formal or informal, and that's the critical language. And it can, can include demands made before a formal legal action is commenced. Uh, obviously, the liability policy defines which legal actions are insured under the policy. But now we have a situation where a legal action can be something that's informal. The first question I ask, not really for anyone really to answer, is why did the restatements drafters even feel compelled to address this? In other words, why were they not satisfied what, with, with what we all understood to be a legal action and why they're redefining that term? Scott and I have discussed this and, and basically our guess is as good as yours, but it's important to take note of this definition. For whatever advantage it may afford, it will certainly be argued by an insured or a claimant's attorney that a legal action may now be something informal. In other words, whatever that means, can it be so informal that it's now a letter from an attorney or possibly a public adjuster, even though public adjusters are not supposed to practice law in Pennsylvania, although they seemingly do? Uh, does the submission of the claim itself, that is a demand for money under a policy, whether first or third party, fall within the drafter's intended meaning of legal action? It's certainly informal, and it's certainly seeking redress. Is the appraisal process a legal action? I don't know the answers to these, but you should be aware that the restatement has posited, excuse me, this new definition of a legal action. Under no circumstances are Scott and I telling you as a carrier that you should treat the insured as an adversary just because he, he or she sent you a letter that the restatement may now consider a legal action, or for that matter, that the insured may consider a legal action. Obviously, the insured is not an adversary, or at least under most circumstances is not. In fact, they pay our bills. But if something as informal as a letter of demand is now a legal action, it may unfortunately affect the dynamic of the relationship. And this is simply a cautionary tale and Scott will tell you the implication of the redefinition in the context of settlements and the duty to defend and indemnify. But again, realize what you thought was a legal action 
and what I thought was a legal action may no longer be a legal action. This is another term, condition. I don't know if uh, we, we thought that condition was something that we understood, or I think we thought we knew what a condition was. In a liability insurance policy, it's an event under the control of an insured policyholder or insurer that unless excused, must occur or must not occur before performance under the policy becomes due. We have issues now of who bears the burden. Uh, it's interesting because if you think about it, what conditions are there in the policy of insurance that we as carriers or carrier representatives ordinarily are obligated to comply with? Typically, I think of a condition as something that the insured must comply with in order to satisfy his or her obligation to assert a claim or claim for coverage. Certainly, we have contractual obligations as an insurer as to how to respond to claims, but what conditions? The restatement would suggest without more that insurers may be in control of certain conditions under the policy. Whereas the rule in PA is that the insured bears the burden of proving compliance with conditions, the restatement suggests that that burden may now fall on the carrier to prove non-compliance. And obviously those of us who defend these types of cases uh, a claim of an exclusion or, or for a non-compliance with a condition. This is just one more hurdle to support a legitimate coverage defense. Scott, I'm going to take a bit of a shot at you. Don't turn your mic back on. Scott cited the Peters Township case in the slide, if you see that there. I haven't told Scott this yet, but I handled that case and lost it before the Third Circuit on my birthday 31 years ago. I won it on summary judgment, but that doesn't count. Scott, you could have chosen to cite another case. Also, the award was $10 million to pay for damage to a mine subsidence to a school. So happy birthday to me and, and thank you, Scott. We're gonna talk now about ambiguity and policy interpretation. The, uh, the, the RLI changes the way policies are to be interpreted. Again, that's if it's adopted in Pennsylvania. Uh, in PA, obviously, and in most jurisdictions, a policy must be construed according to its plain terms when the policy is unambiguous. Now this is the version you'll see in the restatement. In the restatement, courts can look to dictionaries, court decisions, statutes, regulations, and secondary legal authorities such as treatises and law review articles. Also, it encourages the uh, use, or I should say the reference to custom, practice, and usage evidence. Hey, can I just jump in here real quick on this this last absolutely point? absolutely and what's not in this slide and I think it's demonstrative of the fact that the the authors of this are not practicing the way we practice when they said you can rely on custom practice and usage evidence or they're recommending it as part of policy interpretation without there being ambiguity. The rationale that they employed was, it's not that expensive. All you need is one or two experts and or people in the field, and they can tell you what the custom and practice is. So it's not going to be overly burdensome to the carriers or overly burdensome or inexpensive to the insureds. Thanks, Scott. Now, obviously, courts looking to the dictionary or statutes, regulations, and past precedent, that's, that's always been the case uh, to determine uh, whether or not a policy is ambiguous. So that's really not a surprise. But as Scott's pointed out, now they're going to expand it. And even where it is unambiguous, they're going to have us looking at things such as secondary legal authorities, the restatement itself, law review articles and treatises, and those of you not familiar with treatises, it's just a fancy term 
for what someone with a good reputation or for that matter, any reputation wrote about a subject. And now these can be considered by the court if Pennsylvania adopts the restatement. Whereas PA law is that when it's unambiguous, you stay within the four corners. If this restatement's adopted by courts in PA, the four corners may now be more corners, such as a corner of every page of every source or resource a court chooses to rely upon. And, and Scott pointed out, note that second bullet point, and this is important. The restatement encourages courts to consider such things as custom practice and usage. In other words, how are carriers handling their claims with other insureds or even one other insured? We see this more on the property side where a public adjuster or we'll say a policyholders council will keep track of what carriers are doing on certain issues. And I suspect, Scott, you've seen this and many of the lawyers and, and those of you in the webinar have seen this. Such claims handling matters as matching, depreciating labor, profit and overhead, and other similar issues are now part of a public adjuster or an attorney's database. Uh, XYZ Mutual Company's handling a claim where it tells an adjuster to depreciate labor, yet there's information out there that on a prior claim or claims it paid full labor cost when it paid ACV and didn't appreciate it. Unfortunately, in the past, in-house and independent adjusters for companies maybe have practices that aren't consistent. So one thing that we are trying to impress upon you now that custom and usage, if, if adopted, if the restatement's adopted, now that custom and usage may be considered even where a policy is unambiguous, is to be consistent, handle claims consistently, and be sure every adjuster, whether in-house or outside, handles a claim and interprets a policy the same way. And unfortunately, again, Scott and I have addressed this, social media, the internet, the ability to search Google and websites where they disparage carriers or at least say how a claim was handled, now give a real advantage to public adjusters and attorneys to review complaints or even accolades of insureds on those sites and then to throw them back at you. And you may hear it even if it's a practice or custom of a competing insurer to which they are referring. And of course, I've heard experts refer to custom and usage and then you have to ask yourself, where did you get that information and whose custom and whose usage? So I see this as a real area of concern under the restatement because one man's custom and usage may not be another's, one carrier's custom and usage may not be another's. So just beware. Ambiguous terms. Now, as we all know, or I should say we should know, is ambiguous terms are to be construed against the uh, maker of the policy, which in most cases, 99% of the time, is gonna be the insurance company. Unless that insurance company can persuade the court that a reasonable person in the policy's holder's position would not give the term that interpretation. So you have to ask yourself though, is there a change in the restatement? And indeed there is. Ambiguous terms are to be construed against the party that supplied the term unless the party persuades the court that a reasonable person in the policyholder's position would not give the term that interpretation. And you may say, what's the difference? Well, the difference is now, if you accept for the, the language in the restatement, we're not looking at that specific insured, but we're being asked to look at what a reasonable person in the policyholder's position would or would not have given to the interpretation. This is purportedly an objective standard as opposed to an subjective standard or test, and it's intended to include the observable objective characteristics of the policyholder that identify him or her as a member of a relevant class. Now, I realize that's all fancy terminology, but right now we don't know what the objective reasonable person is contemplated to be under the restatement and we'll only know that on a case-by-case -case basis if the court adopts this rationale for interpreting an insurance policy. 
I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I ever met the objective or reasonable man or woman. Everyone is so different and may be so different from our insured. So if you have a case and you decide I'm going to depose the insured and find out what he or she knew or believed or thought was reasonable, that may not be enough if Pennsylvania adopts the restatement and especially its interpretation of how to treat ambiguity. Uh, we also, uh, for those of you that are familiar with the past treatment of ambiguous terms, generally speaking, uh, the individual lay person was treated different than the sophisticated policyholder. Uh, there was an exception for the sophisticated policyholder uh, with a commercial policy. The restatement suggests that carriers should no longer be able to argue that a commercial policyholder was so sophisticated and clearly knew or should have known the intent of a policy. He'll be treated the same as the individual policyholder, no more or no less. And that's obviously a change if adopted. I think, we, I think we're with you now, Scott, turning over to you. Yep, I'm gonna take over at this point. And uh, I do want to apologize to everybody because one thing that Dick and I failed to mention at the outset is that if there are any questions that you may have as we go forward, we're gonna be allotting about five minutes at the end of this presentation for any questions or comments that anybody might have. Although if you wanna fire them off to Dick and I in advance, um, the webinar does have that capability and then we'll just run through those as we uh, near the end here. Now. Let me now ask you, Scott, this, Scott, were there anything you wanted to comment on about the section that I handled? Did I miss anything? No, other than the fact that uh, I, I may be buying uh, bottles of Tums for uh, a lot of the people on this call as they're hearing us talk and thinking, my goodness, how in the world could people come up with something like this? You know, adjusting seemed to be so simple before. You know, you have the policy, you have a loss, you compare A to B, and then you either get to see or, or you don't get to see. And now we have all this new lingo. And I, I think the one thing that Dick and I are highlighting for all of you is why so many people dislike lawyers. Because it was lawyers who came up with this. And it took eight years for them to come up with this particular restatement. But the good news, and I'm saying that facetiously, of course, is that the good news doesn't just end with what Dick was talking about, but now when we get into the coverage disputes, okay, we're beyond the policy interpretation. What does the restatement suggest and do with, with these? Now, reservation of rights, it's a phrase all of us know and understand. This is going to be one of the next big wrinkles with the restatement should a court decide to adopt it. Now, according to the drafters, reservations must include not only the specific policy terms, but also the facts on which the coverage issue is based. Now, this is a cautionary tale because there are, I'm sure, instances out there. I got it, you know, the last time I had an insurance claim myself where it was a letter from carrier X, we're investigating your claim. Here's three pages of policy provisions. We're reserving our rights while the investigation continues. Now, I understood what was going on there, but to a lay person who says, okay, I just had a, a leak on my roof and I have a five page letter with four and three quarter pages of policy provisions. Well, what's going on here? The restatement says you have to give some indication to the insureds about why that reservation is there. Is it something that an adjuster noted at the property? If we're talking a liability case, is it, something in terms of how the loss happened, or whether we're talking a leak from an underground oil tank and perhaps a pollution exclusion, a permissive use issue, those types of things need to be spelled out. 
Now, here's the knuckleball that they're throwing at everybody. The re restatement also says the letter has to be written in language understandable by a reasonable person in the position of the insured. What in the world does that mean? In language understandable by a reasonable person. Does that mean that you need to understand the education level of your insureds to dr and draft a letter based on that? We Scott, don't know. Scott, I, I tell you what, Scott, I, I, I guess I do mean to interrupt because I just did. <laughs> I have a claim right now with a significant carrier, a carrier that writes in all 50 states, I presume, and they do not have letters, or at least were unable to provide me with letters in Spanish. And I have an insured whose claim we are investigating, and I have had to send the letters out to an interpreter to put them in Spanish because my insured otherwise does not understand the letters or when I communicate with her. And, and the problem with that isn't so much that I'm putting them or sending the letters out to be interpreted, but can you imagine the difference in the nuances with insurance coverage if I am reciting insurance coverage in English and then having to translate it in Spanish, how that could affect the interpretation understandably so by the insured. So I'm dealing with that exact situation right now, changing letters into Spanish. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a great example. Let's move beyond the reservations for a moment and talk about, and this is really directed to the, the liability folks out there right now. what are the consequences for a failure to defend? And some of this is consistent with Pennsylvania law. So I think what we're showing you here is not something that's going to alarm some of you, perhaps the way the restatement uh, view of reservations of rights did. But under the restatement, they're saying, obviously, if you breach your duty to defend, you deny it outright. We're not covering this, Mr. Insured. You're in this litigation on your own. You don't have then the right to assert any control over the defense going forward or the settlement of that case. That's consistent with what we all know in Pennsylvania. But here's perhaps a little bit of a twist. And this is a little bit of a, a shining light where the restatement authors came to their senses a little bit. In Pennsylvania, if you denied the defense to somebody because you have a, what you believe to be a lock solid coverage defense, you could go and assert that in the ensuing coverage litigation. There's a minority of courts that followed the rule that if you don't defend, you just outright deny, you forfeit your coverage defenses. Now, the restatement in the earlier text was advocating for the minority rule, actually saying this is what should be the law of the land. And this is where we tip our hats to the insurance industry because there was a big pushback to that. And perhaps some of you were involved in that or your carriers were involved in that. So the restatement came a little bit more to the middle and said, you're not going to have an automatic forfeiture, but you could lose the defense if the breach was in bad faith. Now, we knew that phrase bad faith was going to sneak in here somewhere along the way. Here's where it is in terms of whether you can keep the coverage, or you lose the coverage defense. Settlement offers. This was 
I about fell off my chair when I was reading this for the very first time in the very first draft. Under the restatements view, you have to dig down into the comments here, but they are advocating a position that even where you don't get a settlement demand from a claimant, and I'm talking, this is strictly on the liability folks in Pennsylvania because property insurance is treated differently. But where the claimant hasn't made a settlement demand, the authors believe that you as the insurer may be obligated to make a settlement offer. Now, when they put that in there, there was no caveat to that that said, well, only if you believe your insured was liable or predominantly liable for the loss. It's just, that's word for word. You may be obligated to make a settlement offer. And then they go on to give us even more headaches by saying, well, even if you have a reservation of rights, that may not relieve you of the duty to make reasonable settlement decisions. It's almost like uh, you know, the, the old flow charts, you, know, you go from A to B and then B says, go back to A again. That, that's pretty much what they're saying here. Now, no article or presentation would be complete without us talking about misrepresentations in insurance. And again, remember what I said at the outset, we're not trying to cover everything because we could be on the, this call all day and probably only get through about a third of everything that's in this restatement. So we're trying to hit the issues that you're going to see on a more regular basis. And this is one where the restatement does provide, I'll, I'll, I'll let me back up. I don't want to spoil it too much. I'm going to turn this over to Dick and let him talk about misrepresentations. I was going to let you spoil it, Scott. <laughs> in any event, and, and I do want to remind people in all seriousness, if you do wish to download the entire restatement, they have made it reasonable. You go online, 15 bucks, and you can download it. Uh, but we will talk about misrepresentations. Before I do that, Scott was kind enough uh, to send me an opinion that I would not be surprised that one of the law firms that may be on this webinar may have been involved with. And it's called Preferred Contractors Insurance Company versus Michael Sherman, DBA Sherman Woodcraft and, and others. And it's filed at PA Super 2018 PA Super 215. It was decided two days ago. I don't have any Atlantic site for it, but it's an interesting case for those of you that enjoy reading cases because it actually does discuss subjects of misrepresentation on an application on a commercial policy. Uh, it does address the obligation, or I should say the, the responsibility or liability of an agent or a broker when there is a misrep. Uh, it does discuss the obligation of an insurance company to deliver the policy and what's the effect of a failure to, not to deliver. And it's simply a very interesting case at the superior court level. Again, it's preferred contractors insurance company versus Michael Sherman. And uh, it was decided two days ago. So if any of you in the audience actually handled that case, uh, you were presented with a very interesting situation. But let's talk about misrepresentations. And let me click to the last, next slide. I'm sure we've all heard the term innocent misrepresentation, but it's not a term that we often heard, I'll say outside of uh, life and health coverage. Uh, typically a misrepresentation was a misrepresentation was a misrepresentation. Uh, and, it, and it's most often raised in connection with policy applications or changes in condition. And this is language from the, uh, or I should say, based on a fairness objection, the restatement has indicated that policyholders who purchase liability insurance as protection from negligence, which is why typically you purchase liability insurance, those policyholders should also be able to argue that they should be protected from negligence in applying for insurance. In other words, because 
And I'm not sure that the connection between the two, I don't know how the restatement made this connection, but because you buy liability insurance to protect you from negligence, you should be protected from your own negligence in applying for the insurance in the first instance. Uh, you know, arguments such as, I didn't read it. And we've all heard this, all, all of those who handle claims, whether on the claim side or as attorneys, the insured argues, I didn't read it, I just signed. Or I was in a hurry and just checked the box, not intentionally, but because I didn't pay attention. Another example might be the telephone application that the insured e-signs without reading. And we've all had those cases. I recently had a very large commercial fire where the insured answered no to a series of questions in the application because as he said, I was in a hurry. And somehow the word yes, containing only one more letter would have taken longer for him to answer. And yes would have been the truth and no was, was a false answer. But that was his explanation, I was in a hurry. If PA courts accept or buy into the innocent misrepresentation argument, meaning that all an insured need do anytime he misrepresents something in an application or, uh, well, in an application principally, if, if, if an insured can argue that in every case, then we will simply be buying a trial in every case, getting past summary judgment and getting past a clean rescission of a policy. Keep in mind for PA, the evidence for rescission and coverage, when you have a misrep in an application, requires evidence that's clear, precise, and convincing. Now you're also gonna be presented with any number of excuses as to why an insured made what will be termed an innocent mistake in the application. And that's the application that he or she had an opportunity to read and sign. Now, I should point out as a caveat that on the life side by statute, it addresses uh, that applications, answers are not warranties, but rather representations. And it, it's just the idea that we, and let me go to the next slide, that it's difficult enough, I should say, where we as carriers are faced with dealing with an insured's misrepresentation. But when they can simply argue I made a mistake and the restatement endorses that proposition by saying, well, your reason for buying the policy was to insure you against negligence. You should be able to make that same argument when you completed the application. You can just imagine what we're going to be faced with. The restatement also has come down with this pronouncement, and that is if an insurer rescinds a policy for a misrepresentation, it must return the full premium. Now, I will say that it has been my, uh, I should say, recommendation to clients that when you are rescinding a policy, you return the entire premium. But both Scott and I have had situations where carriers have only returned the unearned premium. The restatement makes it very clear that you are to return the entire premium. I will tell you this, that if there is a specific statute in Pennsylvania or in whatever jurisdiction you practice, but obviously we're principally PA, if there is a um, articulated statute regarding misrepresentation that says that a misrepresentation, basically it makes it strict liability, uh, then the argument of innocent misrepresentation will not apply. In other words, the statute will control. But just realize, for those of us that review claims and claim submissions and applications, whether as attorneys, whether as underwriters, whether as claims people, you will have this hurdle, uh, you will have this hurdle to cross because, or to, to get over, because now the restatement, if it is accepted in Pennsylvania or adopted, certainly is going to make it that much more difficult. Scott, I think I'm turning it over to you now. All right, thank you very much. And with that, we're, we're quickly coming to the, uh, the end of the presentation here, but I, I wanna try and wrap everything up as, as best I can here. Um, 
and give everybody as, as many solid takeaways from this. And, and Dick and I had talked about a number of these as we were gearing up for this uh, presentation today. Um, the first thing we want to stress to everybody is that the restatement of insurance that just came out now, it's not the law in Pennsylvania. Will it become parts of it the law? If I was a bet betting man, my I would say probably. Only because you, when we look at the number of instances where courts have look to other restatements, as well as the current composition of our appellate courts, there's probably a pretty good chance that one or more of these sections are going to be looked to for guidance. The other points that we want you to leave here with today, when we get down to the, the brass tacks of it all, The policy interpretation is one where you're, you may be seeing more folks referring to that sooner rather than later, um, more so on the property side than on the liability side. Although there can be scenarios out there where you have injured party representatives making arguments that certain claims, certain types of injuries are not being evaluated the same from office to office. And there's an inconsistency there, but this is I think gonna be largely a property insurance function for a lot of the reasons that Dick had mentioned before. The takeaway from that, if you get the the letter from the, your adjuster um, in a little bit of panic saying, what is this? I, I, there are all these references to, to practices and customs. The, our recommendation is number one, don't panic. Number two, focus on the facts you have of your loss. What makes your claim unique as to that particular insured? Reservations of rights. The other big takeaway for this is going to be the letters have to explain why the position is. We don't need a 12 page letter. That's not what we're suggesting here, but a short and concise letter that says, here's why we need to look at this claim in more detail is where we believe the authors were going with this. Dick made a phenomenal point about the language. And you know, I've had that issue in the past as well, where you have the non-English speaking, reading, writing insured, and you're trying to send a reservation of rights letter. You may be trying to get that person in for a sworn statement. They're getting a letter that they don't know what it means and just throwing it out. you may have to make sure that letters in the right language here. And I know a lot of carriers have interpretation services when they're speaking with the insureds. You may need to just keep this on your radar screen as something else to look into as these claims move forward here. And then the other great point Dick made is, how is that going to affect the policy interpretation? I mean, us lawyers can do a great job with uh, the policy language when it's written in English. Imagine what someone will do once an interpreter tries to translate it into Spanish, Russian, fill in name of other language there. The, the misrepresentation piece, and I'm kind of glossing over the, the settlement aspect here because I think that speaks for itself, but the, the point that we wanted to stress with that recent case that just came out two days ago. And I think that's a good example of potential insight into the court is that the court there, admittedly, our superior court was looking to language from another state. But what it was also doing was dealing with an issue, and it said it's an issue of fact as to whether the insured who was a contractor made a misrepresentation in the application itself. 
Now, that's where we're getting near the end um, of the presentation here. And there was one question that um, we wanted to go and, uh, and address. Actually, a couple different questions here. I'm going to take them in order. The, the first question was whether the new definition of a legal action changes the carrier's obligation or changes when the carrier's obligation to provide defense counsel is triggered. That's a great question. And a lot of these understand, and Dick chime in if you want as well on any of these points, are really us looking into the crystal ball because no courts have addressed these as of yet. But there may be obligations under certain circumstances where that notice of a claim based on whatever the injuries are, are sufficient that the carrier would arguably have an obligation to get defense counsel involved, make sure certain evidence is preserved, protected, property inspections done in the liability context. Dick, do you have anything to add no, on I, that? I, I, I agree, Scott. I think that uh, in, in some respects it may be a boon to defense lawyers, but uh, no, I do agree. And, and it is a crystal ball situation. I do see a question. Someone is saying, as this is a draft, what is the process as it relates to becoming final? It is final. Yep. What, what you see in the, it, it, I'm going to assume that the question came about because um, that person went online and saw that the, it, at the restate, the ALI website, it's listed as a, a final draft. Mm -hmm. What I can tell you is that final draft was voted on and approved in its entirety during the ALI's spring conference this year. Um, without any additional changes to it. So what you see there is the final version. It was only voted on by the ALI members, that exclusive 4,500 person organization, or at least as many of those folks who attended the conference as they did. Now, it's not in the nice shiny paperback yet, but if you look in the beginning of the document and on the website, they say very clearly, that once the ALI approves a restatement chapter, doesn't have to be the whole thing, but once the chapters are approved, it can be cited and relied on by any court or attorney or person out there in the country. And I can tell you, having followed this for many years, that what you're looking at there is the final draft. Scott, there was a second part to the question is, is it a document that a state must adopt? Courts courts would adopt it if they chose to, is what it is. A court of a certain jurisdiction would refer to it, cite it, whatever. Yeah, exactly. They're not going to whole tail go in and say, we're adopting the restatement of insurance in its entirety, not the way you would see them adopt a, a county adopting the uh, um, uniform, uh, you know, the, the international business code. But rather what they'll do is they'll look to different parts of a restatement and say, we believe that this is an accurate interpretation of the law and are going to apply it that way to a particular circumstance. Right. And if you look at a lot of the jury instructions, that's there, there are many courts that look to the restatement of torts. So I, I, hate to, I hate to cut you guys off here, but uh, we're, we're running out of time and uh, a lot of people are jumping off the webinar at this point. Um, we want to thank uh, Scott and, uh, and Dick for, for presenting today. If you guys have any questions uh, beyond this webinar, uh, we will be sending an email tomorrow with their contact information in it so that you guys can contact them about any question you might have about uh, the presentation today. But we want to thank everyone for attending. And um, like I said, if you have any questions, we'll give you information on how to contact Scott and Dick. Um, we, we will be continuing our webinar education in August uh, with the webinar on Act 41, which provides transparency to the financial exam process. And we're going to be having a really interesting panel of people uh, present on that, including uh, Joseph DeMemo from the insurance department. So we hope that you guys will join us in August for that. And we also want to thank our premium gold sponsors for making this all possible. See you guys in August and thank you guys for attending.